Okay, good. Um, I think I have in my folder here. And my Facebook was screwed up. I saw that. Hmm. Okay. Oh, well, yesterday was the first day this week that I was actually live in person. All right, so Trinity 10. A friend of mine, he's now deceased, he translated from the old church agenda, so the pastor book, where it actually had, from the Kirchen agenda, if you're evangelical, you don't need to know it, the one we used here, 1922, um, Concerning the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. Yeah, it's, it's a little long, so I won't read too much of it. Maybe You want me to read the juicy bits? Uh, uh, let's see. I'll start at the beginning. Um, as, so this is a, uh, CFW Walter, one of the founders of the Missouri Synod. He took what Josephus, the historian, Jewish historian, wrote. Probably brought in a little bit of the Roman historian, whatever his name was. I lost the name that records it. Um, and kind of conflated the two, summarized, etc., and made it appropriate for the church. All right, so as the time approached wherein God would at last send forth his wrath against Jerusalem and the Jewish people, I should probably read a little bit more temperately, even as the Lord Christ himself had threatened, the entire Jewish kingdom was vexed at every turn. The high priest practiced tyranny against the other priests. There was hatred and jealousy among other officials. And from this, mobs and all manner of divisive factions and much robbery and murder was found in and around Jerusalem. For this reason, the emperor Nero sent Gessius Florus to the Jewish lands. And compared to him, the Jews were so obstinate in their greed, arrogance, and wantonness, the Jews hunted down and killed 5,000 of his men. So you hunt down and kill 5,000 Roman soldiers, this is not going to go well for you, right? The Jews were also fanatical because of the will of God about setting themselves against the Romans and revolting. When the emperor Nero became aware of this, he sent Flavius Vespasian, Pasanius, excuse me, and his son Titus to Syria. All right, so then there's a bunch of histor history stuff, and there's caves, and there's people. Uh, there's murder, robbery, plundering. Josephus wrote that 12,000 of the best and noblest Jews were overtaken in the uproar when they went into the temple and had their houses and possessions given as plunder to the mob and of the vulgar and lowly. So it was that even before agreeable weather returned, Jerusalem had been plagued with threefold misfortune, namely a war with Rome, with insurrection and all manner of mutiny, and tyranny, which had faction rising against faction with the knowledge of the rulers shedding much blood. Okay, then it's winter. Vespasian's there. Nero is dead. Da, 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 da. There's stuff going on in the temple. There's another uprising. Titus, remember I talked about Titus. He comes. Uh, and then Titus saw the city. We'll skip, start there. Cra overcrowded beyond counting, hastily armed and reinforced himself in order to lay siege to the city and as Christ had foretold, to encircle it with wagons so that hunger might drive them to greater distress and anxiety. So, yeah, when you siege this, what do you call that? Um, siege wall? No. Yeah, it's just a siege, but with a city so that nobody, can, nothing can get in and out. Is there another word for that? Mm, it's not coming to me. You'll think about it. When the Jews saw this, they, with all their might to hinder and prevent this and to keep it from happening, but it was completed and they were out of luck for our Lord God wanted to make an end of them. Ooh. All right. So again, this is Walther summarizing the historians. Um, oh, I said I'd, I'd read for you the uh, juicy bits here. The city of Jerusalem was well fortified and had three walls. This was all read in church, by the way, on this Sunday. I mentioned that in the sermon. Therefore, the Roman forces approached in full force to storm the city. And after much work, the first and second walls conquered and taken. So they had multiple city walls, right? At the same time, an innumerable multitude of people died of hunger, as Josephus wrote. The best of friends would often become to blows over a small piece of bread. Children would often rip food from their parents' mouths. Neither brother nor sister had mercy upon each other. A bushel of corn was more precious than gold. Driven by hunger, some ate manure, some the cinches of their saddles, some the leather stripped from their shields. Some still had hay in their mouths when their bodies were found. Yeah. Some sought to escape starvation by means of their own filth. Use your imagination. So many died of starvation that 115,000 corpses were found in the city and buried. 
Now that, that's a lot bigger than the city of Jerusalem normally is. So as the Romans were coming, everybody was moving into the city because it had a fortress, right? Uh, Hegesippus reported that at one gate alone, several thousand were carried out and that 600,000 died because of the siege. That's what he recorded. Don't know. Josephus reported that such a fearful, gruesome event occurred that future generations would hardly be able to believe it. There, were a res there was a respected woman, wealthy and well-bred, across the Jordan, having fled Jerusalem in fear with some others. Now, since the city had been so grievously beset with hunger, with what manner of crying and pain one can only imagine, she slaughtered her young child in the cradle, roasted half of it, and ate it. When the soldiers came by looking for food, she set the remaining portion before them. The soldiers removed themselves from the gruesome scene and having mercy upon the miserable woman, revealed this event to the Lord of Jerusalem. Yeah, I, when I said juicy bits, I didn't quite mean it like that. Uh, let's see, okay. Thus the city of Jerusalem, we'll just get to the end, was destroyed and razed on the eighth day of September in the fifth month of the siege. So Trinity 10 also tends to fall pretty close to the actual day, September 8th, sometimes closer, sometimes further, depending on the, the way the moon works, right? From the host of uh, captives, Titus sent 17,000 healthy, young, and strong men to Alexandria as quarry slaves. Many Jews were sold as cheaply as animals. 2,000 were distributed across the entire Roman Empire to become players in the spectacles. So, Colosseum, yeah. And to be torn apart by wild beasts in the arenas. The total number of captives who remained alive came to 97,000. However, at the beginning of the siege, 10 times 100,000 were in the city. So like all of Judah crunched into that little city that normally only had a few thousand people in it, except for at the Passover and other feast times, right? Now, there, Josephus is saying there was a million people there, which is just incredible to think about that. Uh, 10,000 times 100,000, right? Yep. The majority of them strangers and not residents, although all were of Jewish descent and blood. Thus Jerusalem, the most celebrated city in all the east, came to a miserable and lamentable end, as had been prophesied, in the 70, 70th year after the birth of Christ, our Lord. So I didn't read you all of it, but pretty incredible. And you're like, okay. Yeah, the whole bit about the woman roasting her own child. That's something else. This is a summary of Josephus, a Jewish historian, written by C.F.W. Walther. Yeah. One of the founders, first president of the Missouri Synod. So, there you go. Well, on that upbeat note, um, let's look at Hebrews. <laughs> All right. So, uh, where did we leave off? Probably nobody remembers. Has it been a couple weeks? Seems like it's been a couple weeks. When was the last? We didn't meet last week because we had the event, right? All right. So we are in, I know we're in chapter 13. We're towards the end of it, uh, which is the last chapter. So remember, we talked about it's only after establishing um, who God is for us in Christ, you know, that he is um, our high priest that intercedes for us, that he makes, uh, that he gives to us his gifts, as we talked about in church today. Only then, at the very, very end of this sermon slash letter, it ends up being a letter, does the preacher teacher make some, what we call exhortation, some instruction, right? So this is really important to note. We've talked about it the last couple of times we've met that uh, you can't tell Christians what to do outside of actually telling them who they are in God, you know, in Christ, like we talked about with baptism this week, right? Not until the fifth day did we even talk about, like, this is our vocation now as Christians, because we have to establish who God is and who he has made us. And that's all by way of giving. And then it's only at the end can we talk about um, our sacrifice, you might say. Which we'll talk about here in a minute. All right. It is wet in here. Am I just wet from church? Or is it both? I feel like, I feel like the moisture on me is not evaporating. <laughs> it's, it's musty. Okay. Um, I figure if I complain enough, someday somebody will be like, you know what, Pastor, I'm just going to pay for AC. So wearing the collar does that make your... Oh, yeah. <laughs> you don't mind. <laughs> yeah, I can untuck my shirt. Yeah, whatever. The black doesn't help. Actually, if I was, a couple people asked me this morning, they're like, are you wearing your cassock, you know, the full one-piece black, like robe, basically? 
I forget that actually if you wear that without all of this, it's actually kind of nice because it's loose fitting and yeah. But anyway, whatever. All right, so what are we talking about? We're going to talk about this. So there's some instruction here, right? To care for those in prison, to entertain strangers because they might be angels, um, to uh, hold marriage in respect among all of you, uh, to keep your life free from the love of money, which is a kind of constant problem, is it not? Um, be content with what you have because the Lord's going to take care of you. To remember your leaders, all right? And now when leaders, we're talking about leaders in the church, not secular leaders, all right? You can remember them too. You probably don't have great memories of them though. That was a joke. It was supposed to be funny. I don't know. All right, good. Um, I mean, it's, it's true. We, we do remember them in our prayers, um, but you, there's like a twofold thing that happens. By remembering your leaders in your prayers, like say, I don't know, um, you know, the, the, the mayor, the township people, are they, do they have like a board, the township? Yeah, okay. Um, you know, your state representatives, your governors, these people, judges, magistrates, all these people, um, federal government people. By remembering them in your prayers, that, that does change your orientation towards them. Because that's what prayer does, is it reorients your mind and your, your direct, you know, how you relate to people. Like praying for your enemies, for example, changes how you think of your enemies. <laughs> I mean, maybe you pray that God destroy them, right? But that still changes it because now you're saying, God, you take care of the problem, not me, right? Vengeance is yours, not mine, right? Or, and especially if you pray, forgive them, then that's going to change your disposition if you do encounter them, right? You're going to see them as somebody who Jesus died for. Same thing with civil rulers. So you pray for them that there be justice and peace and that evil doing be, uh, however I said it in the prayers today, can't remember. Uh, but at the same time, then, that changes your orientation towards them, and you recognize what their job is, right, according to God. And maybe, actually, you talk to them and you say, hey, look, you know, it is 100% irresponsible for you to continue to, like, expand the debt ceiling and continue to pour money into fluff projects that don't matter, right? Uh, infrastructure bill, for example. Maybe some of them. I think probably everything matters in there to somebody, <laughs> but is it all important now? Yeah, anyway. Right. And so now your orientation has changed. You recognize maybe there, you do have, you actually have an authority to speak to them. They're supposed to represent you, not the other way around. Hmm. All right. So why did I bring that up? Oh, yes. Remember your leaders. But here it's your church leaders, right? Those who spoke to you the word of God. Uh, imitate them. We talked at length about that previously. Uh, do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings. So here it's talking about foods in specific, like what foods you can eat and not eat. Um, that's, the Lutherans had something to say about that at the beginning of the Reformation. You probably still have friends that don't eat red meat on Fridays. You grew up Roman Catholic, you know about that. Yeah. Um, so it's still around, that idea that there's prescribed fasting, you know. Um, the Lutheran church, not prescribed, yeah, prescribed by the church. Uh, Lutherans have long fasted. We just kind of lost sight of it because we didn't make it mandatory. <laughs> so we said, you're free to fast, and here's some suggestions. And then people say, well, if I'm free, I'm going to not do it anymore. Thanks for the freedom. So like during Advent and Lent, it would be Wednesdays and Fridays. Not just Fridays, but Wednesday and Friday. Because this is how Lutherans historically act. If Roman did it one way, we did it even worse. So Rome said, you know what? We don't need all the ceremonies anymore at the Council of Trent in the uh, 16th century. So Lutherans say, we're going to do it even bigger than we did before. You say we don't have to, so we're free to do as much as we want now. So uh, the Lutheran mass typically, like we're the only ones that sing the words of institution. That was an innovation to say, yeah, anyway, to elevate God's word specifically there. All right, uh, by the way, yeah, there, that's that. We have an altar from which... Uh, those who serve the tent have no right to eat. We talked about Jesus being suffering outside the tent. Um, the Christian altar where the Lord's Supper is given is really of a different kind than the Old Testament one. You have to go back and listen or watch to catch all of this. All right, so this is where we left off. Uh, I think about verse 15, but we could go back actually to 12 because it's super relevant for us. Actually, maybe we should do this. All right, so 
Uh, starting in verse 10 of chapter 13, because it's appropriate for the day. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So, Jesus also suffered outside the gate of Jerusalem, right? In order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. So remember, he was crucified on Calvary, Cal or Golgotha, right? Another name for it, which is outside. It was actually right next to the garbage dump, Gehenna, as they called it, or which we also call hell. But I mean, can you think of anything worse than burning feces? That's hell. <laughs> um, but notice there, verse 14 to today's uh, text. For here we have no lasting city. All right? So that's one of the things that we could have talked about today is how, you know, the idea that they bound their identity to this earthly city of Jerusalem and to this earthly kingdom of Israel uh, was false. I mean, it's, it was misleading because those things were always given as a point or a point of comparison to the heavenly Jerusalem, the eternal kingdom, the new Israel, right? So even going into the promised land, um, you know, back after, at the Exodus, was actually uh, what's revealed to us by Jesus is that's a type or a shadow of how we're delivered from bondage and sin and death and slavery um, to Pharaoh, our Pharaoh, which is the devil, into the promised land of his kingdom, which is forgiveness, life, and mercy, right? Which happens now in the church, but it's not actually a place. It's actually a, if it's not a place, what is it? Because it's the, wherever Jesus is, is the kingdom, right? But it's not, it's not spatially oriented. Uh, it's, it's actually metaphysical, right? It's uh, a spiritual orientation. So that uh, Christ's kingdom is wherever Christ is, where two or three are gathered in his name, which is beautiful, right? You don't have to go over to Jerusalem. We don't have to restore the temple on Zion, Mount Zion in Jerusalem. Not, that's not to say that we can't like, be allies with Israel and protect their country, but it's not for the sake of Jesus coming again or something, um, which is a misreading of Revelation. Uh, and right here, you have Hebrews confirming that, right? that we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Right? Heavenly Jerusalem, if you like. The, the place of true and lasting peace. Not like Jerusalem, Jerusalem you who kill the prophets and um, murder those who are sent to you, which is what Jesus says. By the way, there's more judgment on Jerusalem in the lectionary. I kind of spoiled it today, thinking, oh, that's it. Thank goodness we got through that. Just wait. <laughs> but wait, there's more. It's at the end of the church here, though. So you get a, you get a little bit of a re respite. All right? And then here, again, this is an, just an exhortation to those who have already received the good news of salvation in Christ to exhort them uh, to some new manner of life according to the spirit that they have dwelling in them. Verse 16, Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Um, so we should talk about that because uh, in the Roman church, they have something called the sacrifice uh, of the mass. Have you heard of this? Remember this sacrifice of the mass? All right. So you can look at the, what the priest does in a Roman church and it explains what they believe. So um, it's one of the reasons I, in the time I've been here, I've actually changed my practice a little bit with the Lord's Supper. That I bring, I take the, I take the host off of the altar and I hold it before you. Same thing with the cup. All right, I can't hold the cup and the individual cups. I don't. I haven't figured. Out, there's like no way to do this. Whereas in the Roman rite, the old Roman rite anyway, all of that was done facing the altar. Now you can do it that way, and I did for almost my entire ministry until recently. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that either, except what the Roman Church teaches by way of their actions. And then Lutherans take what we did and they change it, right? But we, we kept doing the same thing, but we said we believe something different, which is confusing for people. They're like, well, you look the same. How can you mean something different? Well, anyway. The Roman church, they take the bread and they hold it up, right? And they're facing the altar, right? Same thing with the cup. They hold it up, right? We call that the elevation. Now I hold it up too, but to present it to you, to eat and to drink, right? They hold it up before the altar. Why? 
They believe um, that they are taking Christ's body and blood and they're sacrificing it to God the Father again for their sins. Over and over, every time you celebrate the Mass in the Roman Church, you're sacrificing Jesus again to the Father. They call it the unbloody sacrifice. Anybody heard of this? Right. This, is, this is what the Roman Church teaches. So, so this is why it's very important that you celebrate the Mass. Because every time you're actually going to Golgotha again and you're crucifying him again. Now, it's not in the Bible. So the first problem with it. Um, the second problem with it is, is it, it confuses the orientation of things. So you've noticed that like, when we speak of baptism, Lord's Supper, absolution, the language is always by way of gift, right? That Jesus gives himself to you in the supper. So instead of we are offering Jesus to the Father, it's the other way around. The Father offers Jesus to us in his body and blood in the supper. So you might think of it in terms of arrows, if that's helpful. You know, instead of this, it's this. This is the way of gift. This is the way of sacrifice. Okay? So it comes... Sorry, my handwriting. I haven't written for a while, apparently. Uh, Father, Son, you, or the priest in that case. Here it's the Father gives the Son to you. Son. Make sense? All right. So you can see the Lutherans, even if we do the same actions, it's the completely opposite direction of things. <laughs> which makes it hard to explain, unless you just say, well, you know what, we're going to tweak things a little bit, we're going to do things a little bit differently, so that you see it comes down from God to you, and you receive it in your hand or in your mouth, right? Yeah. And this is very important, because um, the language of gift, this is the, the churchy word we use for this, or we should do this, All right. is sacrament, right? So when they say sacrament, they mean things that we do for God. When we say sacrament, we mean things God does for us. I'm like, well, then how can we... Definitions matter, right? You have to define your terms. Always define your terms. So sacrament is a gift. It's an easy way to put it. It's a gift, word of God, attached to a sign, to quote Augustine on that. right? So water attached to his word. Bread and wine attached to his word. right? Absolution attached to a word. I forgive you. And it's given to you. It's a gift from the Father by way of the Son through the Spirit to you. Follow? Ah, but is there sacrifice? There is still sacrifice um, in the liturgy, in the divine service. And you see it here. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So rather than make sacrifices to God, who do we sacrifice to? One another, right. So we love one another. Faith toward God, love towards one another. You've heard that orientation every Sunday, right? I know it's repetitive, but re repetition is good. Mother of all learning. So now sacrifices are oriented towards one another. Uh, and I try to give you some hints towards this. I don't like to add a lot of like extra little bits of instruction in the service. But one of the ones that I do you know, fairly often is to say, uh, we confess our common Christian faith and show love for one another by confessing together the Nicene Creed. Whereby your, what I'm suggesting to you there is that your voice, confessing what you believe that God has given you by way of the Spirit through your baptism, is a sacrifice for your neighbor. You're, you're offering up these words to go into their ears because it encourages them too. and increases in them faith, hearing your faith confessed. Right? So we make sacrifices. Um, the category that the Bible usually uses for our sacrifices in the liturgy are prayer, praise, and thanksgiving. You've heard those before, right? We offer to God our prayers, our praises, and our thanksgiving. I might even say glory in there, too. We glorify God. You could put that in there, too. And if you understand the sacrifices you make to God in those terms... And then, of course, taking what God has delivered to you and then handing it off to one another in sacrificial love, right? God loves you, so we love the world, kind of thing. Um, then sacrifice is a perfectly acceptable word. We don't have to make sacrifices to make God pleased with us. We sacrifice because God is pleased with us in loving us and his son. Does that make sense? Yeah, I don't know if... It seems like the kind of thing that we have to explain often because, well, for one thing... Um, there is not another uh, faith tradition in the world <laughs> that has no sacrifices obligated to their God or gods. 
That is the orientation of every religion in the world, every pagan religion, all of them. You have to do things to make God happy with you. And sacrifices. Could be human sacrifice. It could be acts of works of penance. This is where Rome, calling it the Roman church is what I do, I think is helpful because it, they, as Rome has done actually in many cultures, not just in the Roman Empire, is they take the Roman cult and then they try to Christianize it. So they take this idea of sacrifice and then they just put Jesus on top and say, well, now the sacrifice is Jesus that we give to God who we now call Father instead of Zeus. It ends up being, the, and then we even dress like Roman sacrificial people. <laughs> we dress like we're priests in the temple of Zeus. We still do that, I guess, you yeah, know, whatever. Um, and Rome has done this in other cultures. You have like Pachamama, which is in Brazil, I think. You've got uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico, where they take this pagan female deity and then they say, well, that's just the Virgin Mary. And they're like... So they keep all the rituals too, but they just say, well, now they're oriented towards Mary. Hmm. Right. Uh, whereas, I think if you're going to keep things straight, you're going to recognize that the Christian tradition, in keeping actually with faithful Jewish tradition, those who trusted in the promise, not in the sacrifices, but in the promises that the sacrifices pointed towards, which this book has spent 12 chapters trying to explain to you, but you probably don't remember because it's taken me so long to get through the book. <laughs> right? If you orient it that way, where the sacrifices are actually a sign of the promise being given, right? So you, it's the forgiveness of sins, that promise that's made, which is the point of the sacrifices. But the sacrifices themselves don't do a thing. It's actually Christ's word of promise that does it. That's, he's attached to those things. Um, yeah, so anyway, um, this is, I mean, you could have, I could have talked about this at length in the sermon today, because that's actually how most people approach the church. You know, I mean, it, it was even posted on my Facebook this week, and I, I, try, I, I just had, I couldn't say anything because it's not appropriate to reprimand a member of your congregation publicly on Facebook. I uh, just left it. I thought maybe somebody else might say something, but it's like, it really doesn't matter how much money you give and how much time you volunteer. I like, like when I talk to new members, people want to join, I tell them, we don't need you. We don't need you to do anything. We don't need you to, we don't even need to put money in the plate. You're like, what? Because that's what everybody else teaches. It's like, no. We'd love to have you here so that you receive forgiveness, life, and salvation. That's, that's why we'd like you to be a member of this congregation for the sake of your eternal welfare. You know? Like, really? You don't need any of those things? No. I mean, I'm not going to say no to them. You're free to give them, but I, I don't need them. As soon as you turn it into, like, we need, we need more money, we need more volunteers, we need more, what's the list? The list is long, right? We need more people in church so that we can sing harder hymns because today it was hard to sing some of those hymns because we didn't have enough people. Where were my kids? Because at least they help. You yeah, know, whatever. Where are all the other kids? Blah, blah, blah. You say, we need, we need, we need, we need. And you're like, how about you just be content with what you have, right? And if you teach others the same, you might be surprised how generous they actually are when, when you express to them that you're actually content being who you are. You know? Yeah, I know. It's kind of a, it's a really different way of thinking about it. Well, you're pointing to just a bit of your culture is leading to this. That's one thing. What are you believing? What are you practicing? Yeah. Yeah, all the practices, all the cultural things ought to just be artifacts of what we actually believe, teach, and confess. Right? We do what we do because of what we believe. I think for a lot of people, they do what they do because that's what they do. And then, and then in by not actually knowing why they do what they do or what they believe, then some other belief gets imported, right? That's false. And uh, the one I talked about on Facebook this week, I just use Facebook just to kind of, I don't know, terrorize people with, I, it's just a counter narrative because everything we hear is so like polarized and, and also like, well, it's propagandized so that like all the media is, is somehow in collusion with one another. I know they're on like, they have mailing lists. They correspond with each other. They decide what story is going to be the story for today. It doesn't matter which news outlet you talk about. Fox says, well, we're going to be a little bit more conservative perspective. CNN is going to be, MSNBC is going to be left. CNN is going to try to hold the middle, maybe. And then, they, but they all agree that this is what the story of the day is going to be. 
And they all repeat it over and over and over. Right, so I try to present a counter-narrative. Well, the counter-narrative when it comes to Christian, the Christian church is that we've actually already fallen for, um, for a heresy that was named by a man named Christian Smith, uh, who is a researcher at Notre Dame, a uh, uh, sociologist. Uh, he called it moralistic therapeutic deism, uh, which is actually the same thing as like uh, Thoreau and Emerson and um, Jefferson, their founders. They had the same theology. Moralistic, we do what we think is right, or what others tell us is right to do, right? regardless of God's word. Moralistic. Um, therapeutic, we do, what, we do what we do because it makes us feel better about ourselves, or about whatever. And then deism, and then God's there to help us when he wants, when, when we need it. He's not going to judge us, right? And he doesn't have to give us anything for it you know, to be a believer. So it's a way of living completely independent of God, being I mean, gods to ourselves, doing whatever makes us feel happy. It's kind of a conglomeration of all the ancient heresies. And it's, and it, anyway, that's what people have fallen into. All right, anyway, so no sacrifices. Sacrifices are pleasing to God, right? In that we love, those are sacrifices of love towards one another. So, all right, and then we can keep going. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. All right, so this is why the pastors live in constant anxiety. <laughs> it's not a secular. Uh -uh, it's, no, it's me. It's me. It's the teachers. It's, yeah. It's all those who lead with, it's the elders. It's people who are responsible for your spiritual well-being. And people think, hey, if I don't show up in church, nobody's going to care. Nobody's going to notice. And often we don't. You know, it might be like six months down the line, and I'm thinking, where's, where's she or he been? I'm like, they wanted me to notice in week two. I'm like, I, I can't even remember who was in church last week, much less notice that they haven't been here for two weeks. It might be six, three months, six months, right? But that doesn't mean it's not on my conscience, because once I realize, it's like, what happened here? All right, but here it's the reverse direction. All right, you're responsible for your own spiritual well-being, the pastor, too, though, um, is, is responsible for watching out for you. Um, so that's why you listen to them. Obey them means listen to what they have to say, right? It doesn't mean you do everything they tell you to do. Sometimes they tell you to do things that are kind of stupid, and you say, Pastor, that doesn't really make sense. And you're like, oh, yeah, you're right, hopefully. <laughs> or pastor's like, you know, we're going to do it anyway. And then pastor's like, after it goes wrong, then you say, yeah, you were right. I'm sorry. All right. Um, but submit to them because you have this hierarchy of uh, authority within the church. It doesn't, you don't have to like that there's hierarchy, but anyway, uh, it just makes, may, you might just put this a different way. Don't make your pastor's job already more difficult than it is. <laughs> That'd be another way to say it, right? Just show up, listen. Everything will go actually pretty well at that point for, the, for you and the congregation. And you don't even have to really enjoy it. I'm, just, I'm sorry. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be no advantage to you. Oh, there it is. Don't make your pastor's life difficult because it won't go well for you. It's, there's no advantage to you making, making, making the church worse than it already is. It's already hard enough. It's a, you know, however many, we had 60 saints here, no, 60 sinners here today, <laughs> made saints by the forgiveness of sins, right? But we're still sinners in the flesh. It's, that's going to be challenging. It's always going to be hard to keep people on the same page, going in the same direction, it's like herding cats. Well, well, I say it's like shepherding sheep. We'll put it that way. Let's keep with the Bible analogy, right? Yeah, so why make it more difficult? This is a pretty good instruction. He puts this at the end of his sermon. By the way, don't make my life terrible. <laughs> uh, and, but he keeps going. Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience, desiring to act honorably in all things. I urge you the more earnestly to do this in order that I may be restored to you sooner. So this seems like some kind of epilogue that was attached to it after the fact, after they noted the sermon. But it, this idea that the, um, it's really the only job of the pastor, well, I would say it's the most important job of the pastor, is to serve with a clear conscience, right? And I would say, by extension, then, the congregation, too. How does a pastor, and by extension, a congregation, serve the Lord with a clear conscience? 
I'm going to let you think about it because I need some coffee now. How, how do you have a clear conscience? We talked about conscience earlier in the book, but you probably don't remember because it was so long ago, yada, yada, yada. What is your conscience? What do you think your conscience is? Well, not exactly, but you're right. Some people would say your soul. Some people would say, like Disney, right? It's your sense of right and wrong. Right? Yeah. So to your point, Jim, who informs your conscience? The Holy Spirit, by his word. Yeah, by the word. Right? So your conscience is really, it is that sense of right and wrong. Disney gets it right. But, it, but there isn't like you have this cricket in your head talking to you. <laughs> your conscience is kind of like, well... Apart from, apart from the work of the Holy Spirit and your baptism, it's oriented only towards whatever serves you. So you have, by, by way of your flesh, you have a misinformed conscience. Your conscience, and, and it's only when you hear God's word you recognize that things are not quite lined up. And now your conscience is burdened, right? When you, when you have a guilty conscience, what, it, what, what has happened? God has informed your conscience that what you think is right and true and good isn't really what's good, right, and true. And now you've got a burden. Yeah. And that's kind of like in your sermon, mm -hmm. you say something that hits you as an individual right. all of a sudden, you know, it's like... It informed your conscience. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and some, I don't know. Right. Something really hits you. Yeah, that's God informing your conscience by way of the Spirit through the Word. Right. Exactly. Um, so to serve with a clear conscience is to, or a clear or a, a good conscience, you might even say, is to, is to have what you believe is good, right, and true to be brought into conformity with what God says is good, right, and true. Well, how do you do that as a pastor or as a congregation? Daily prayer. Daily prayer. You're getting there. You do what Jesus tells you to do. <laughs> I know this seems, oh, that's so mind-blowingly complicated. No. No, it's not, it's, not, it's not that hard, yeah. This is, this is Mary, right, at the, at the wedding at Cana. Jesus says, like, what does this have to do with me? Turning water into wine? What, or he said, what does the wine have to do with me? And Mary's like, marriage? The heavenly bridegroom? The da-da-da-da, do it? I think Mary actually understands quite a bit there, somehow, that Jesus does care about weddings, and he does care about marriage, because they were supposed to point forward to his relationship to the church. And she knows that. There's a lot of talk of marriage in the prophets, so it would make sense. Um, but she says to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Right? And I think that's Mary telling the church the same thing. She yeah. yeah, do what he tells you. It's good for you. It'll go well for us. If just We don't have to understand how it's going to go or what's exactly going to happen. Just give it over to Jesus. Let him take care of it. So, yeah, for a clear conscience, um, the way that the the, our constitution here as a congregation, my, my vows as a, a, you know, as a pastor within the church that I made at my ordination and then again at my installation, is that I would, I would only teach what the scriptures teach in accordance with what we confess in our confessions. That's it. I'm going to follow the instructions. You know, that whole, the joke, you know, what, is, what does Bible stand for? I was going to try to find one here. Any of you know the joke, the acronym? What is Bible? Basic instructions before leaving Earth. Thank you, Jim. Well, it's kind of it's it's kind of tacky, but before leaving Earth, I feel like we're going to go up in a spaceship. Um, but it's actually true, in, in that sense, is that um, Jesus says, "What? Forgive your enemy." Right? He says, "Preach the word in season and out." And he says, "Meditate upon his word to all Christians, morning, noon, and night." Right? You know, sing a hymn as you go about your work. This is, it's in the Bible. I know it's in the Catechism too, but it's it's right there. You know, whistle while you work. You know, the sorry, I'm getting a lot of Disney in today. Uh, whistle while you work. Well, whistle a hymn, right? Which is helpful if you uh, learn one or two by heart that way, and you got something to sing each day. All right. So uh, that's how you have a clear conscience: is you do what Jesus says, right? You listen to His word. You follow after Him. You stay on the path. Uh, now you can't do that by your own reason or strength at all. There's no possibility. So you might even reframe it a different way. But you don't resist the work of the Holy Spirit.
The spirit speaks, you say okay. And even in saying okay, that's the spirit working. Yeah. It, it, you know, the mystery of uh, election or predestination, if you prefer, uh, is one that's not one that you can actually tease out. What, then why do some, if it's that easy, then why do some people say no? Why do they keep resisting the work of the Spirit? I don't know. <laughs> Jesus doesn't reveal that to me. He doesn't explain why. Some people will receive the word and others don't. He doesn't explain why Jerusalem rejected him. Although I think we can kind of see mm, some history, uh, I should say some examples in history. It's like, look at what ha happened to Pharaoh with Moses, right? Moses comes and speaks to him. Like after the first plague, or after the first time he was asked, if Pharaoh just said, yeah, go worship in the wilderness, he'll be fine. But the more times Pharaoh says no, what happens to his heart? It gets harder and harder, yeah, to the point where he's, he's so vehemently angry that he's willing to sacrifice everything, all of his soldiers, his horsemen, his chariots, everything, to try to capture a bunch of sheep herders from Israel. From the, from, uh, it wasn't Canaan. It was, well... They weren't even Canaanite, really. They were, um, where was Abraham from? Ur of the Chaldeans. Where did he settle? Goshen. That's where, in Egypt. Where was the in-between place? Interesting story. I was listening to a podcast, um, and they actually found a temple, um, well, like a little pyramid with a temple in front of it, where they had a statue of a guy that looked not Egyptian, looked very much like Joseph, even had a coat with stripes on it. Mm. Yeah, very simple. And the remains of all the bodies buried there are not Egyptian, but they're actually from somewhere near Canaan. Um, and there were a bunch of sheep buried there. And the sheep, they didn't have sheep in Egypt. Sheep were imported. They thought they were dirty animals, um, unclean animals. Yeah, and the sheep were there. Now, if I, I, I wasn't paying enough attention as I was listening. So how well was I listening? I can't remember where they found this. I'd have to look it up. It's like, well, that's mighty coincidental that there would be a whole burial area for like a noble, a wealthy Israelite in Egypt. I can't imagine who that was. With, stripe, with a coat with stripes on it. Yeah. Yeah, archaeology. The problem is they, they um, for like in all the Bibles, they don't accept this because they say it doesn't actually fall in the, at the right time. According to carbon dating, it doesn't come out. It comes out in the 12th dynasty and, it, and Joseph should be in like in the 15th dynasty or something. I don't remember. It's in the wrong dynasty. And they're like, well, maybe we just don't have our timeline right. <laughs> Either for Egypt. Right, I mean, those timelines aren't, aren't fixed in stone. Um, all right, anyway, clear conscience. Desiring to act honorably in all things. All right, now do pastors or congregations always have a clear conscience? No. Right? So what's the source of a clear conscience or a good conscience? Repentance for the forgiveness of sins, right? So this is why I'm opposed to pastors who say, never show your weaknesses to your congregation. It's like, you mean never repent and, you know, to them? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm not perfect. You know that. That's not an excuse, right? So when I do wrong, I actually say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. You know, I'm... Never mind that just a few verses ago, it said, uh, where was this? Oh, yes. Imitate their faith. Consider their, uh, their way of life and imitate their faith. Well, if your pastor isn't repenting for forgiveness of sins, what are you going to imitate then? Pastor who sits, who sits on his throne, all lofty and mighty. Can't really imitate that. All right, anyway. Uh, no advantage to you. Pray for us. We did that. Okay, 19. I urge you the more earnestly to do this in order that I may be restored to you sooner. Now you might understand what's going on there. Whoever wrote this isn't allowed to preach and teach there anymore. <laughs> I don't know why. It doesn't say. Right? But there, there needs to be a reconciliation. and It hasn't happened yet. Can you imagine a pastor saying something that would offend the congregation so much that they'd run them off? I don't have to imagine it, actually, but <laughs> some people do. It does happen. It happens frequently. Sometimes they run him off because he's a terrible preacher and he doesn't preach God's word. That's fine. Uh, but no, we're talking about something different than that. And then here's the, you know, the conclusion. This is a, what we call a benediction, right? Benediction, which are, just means, you know what benediction is? 
what it means in Latin? Bene? Have you been to Italy? Can't go there anymore, right? Unless you get a COVID test and I don't know, whatever. There's no tourism to Italy. Bene, good. Diction, words, right? Good words. Uh, at funeral, we call them eulogies, right? Which you're speaking good words about the deceased, so they don't really benefit the deceased anymore. <laughs> yeah, because they're already dead. But a benediction are words spoken um, that actually do what they say. And maybe you don't think about this in church, uh, but you should. It's a liturgical thing. Um, when, we, when I speak in church, the words that God has given me in Christ to speak, they're not simply just like the thoughts and opinions of my own heart. Right? Especially if they're, you know, they're, they're actually meant to do, like when I say, may the Lord grant it, which was my benediction at the end of the sermon today. That's, I use it often because it's short, it's easy, I don't have to think about it too hard. But may the Lord grant it. That's actually not maybe. I hope he does. He might. What am I saying? Do it. Yeah, to you. Right? Whatever it was, you know, that I asked for at the end of the sermon. And so, you know, that's, uh, most sermons end with some kind of benediction, some kind of word that says, do the thing that, that, it, that it says. Right? So when I say, the Lord bless you and keep you, those words actually do what they say. The Lord is blessing you and keeping you by me saying those words to you. This is, uh, this is what Dr. Kleinig, who wrote the Magnificent Commentary, on uh, Hebrews, calls uh, pastoring by blessing. I, I don't have a great practice of this. He does. But he's an old pastor who's got a lot of practice, and I'm still working at it. Um, but he doesn't ever end a, a conversation with anybody, whether he's a pastor, acting as a pastor explicitly or not, without giving them a blessing. You know, can I say a blessing for you? Right? And he tries to tie it in with whatever the conversation was about. It's this weird idea... It shouldn't be that weird to us, but that was existent, say, with Adam in the garden. There's not a lot we know about Adam in the garden, right? So we don't really want to speculate too much about what life was like in the garden because it doesn't tell us that much. But we do have this idea that Adam, Adam had a verbal command over creation because he names the creatures. He calls them what they are, right? And I'd like to imagine hmm, that he can tell the plants to grow. It's like, really? Well, Jesus does. He tells the storm to be still, right? He tells, he curses the fig tree. I'm using negative examples for Jesus. Does he ever cause something to grow? That would be nice. Yeah. Um, well, that's what he does every day, actually. <laughs> right? So there's this, it's this weird idea that, that what pastor is saying are just words. And then it's up to me to make them do something. You ever heard this? Like, pastor... You probably had not heard this because you don't hear what pastors hear. Um, you know, pastor, I haven't, I, I don't know how that was relevant to my life, for example. Uh, and in one sense, that's probably true. Sometimes it's hard to apply what's being said to your particular life situation, right? But imagine like today, you have family members who have left the church. And you might be, probably didn't have a hard time applying it and saying, no, what do I do? What do we do about that? Right? Um, Anyway, so there's, there's lots of words. Pretty much the whole liturgy start to finish is Jesus speaking by way of the pastor to do something to you or for you. Forgive your sins. To give you his body and blood. To promise you life and salvation. To bless you and keep you. Right? And even um, when, I, when I visit the sick, I pray a word of blessing there that, they, that the Lord give them healing. Now, sometimes we couch that in, in little catchphrases, like, if it be your will, which is another way of saying I don't really believe that Jesus can heal this person. Well, at least I want to at least provide an out in case he doesn't. <laughs> I, it's, it's true. We, we say that thy will be done in the Lord's Prayer. So I don't want to make too much of it. But it is kind of interesting how we don't just actually pray directly and just say, do it. Because that's how Jesus prays. That's how the psalmist prays. Um, that's how the prophets pray. Um, so that's what this is. This is actually a word of blessing, uh, and it's direct. And you notice there's no, I mean, this may language, there's a little letter here. I wonder what the letter says. See Romans 15, 13. All right, so you want to know the grammar, because you're big grammar people, right? Uh, that word may does not occur in 
in the, uh, in the Greek. It's not there. Um, it's because the, I'm looking here, that's verse 20, right? Now me, da, 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 uh, got because it's aorist active participle. So I don't usually put the may in there. I wonder how Dr. Kleine translates it. Now the God of peace. Why do you put the may in there? Because may in English now means might, maybe. Uh, I think in the old King James, it was fine. This is ESV, actually. But no, this is how he translates it. The God of peace who brought you back from the dead, or brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, with the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you, good, active, equip you with every good thing so that you may do his will. Now there it's actually appropriate uh, because it's subjunctive case. Working in us what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right. So now the God of peace, who brought you back, the great shepherd, with the blood of his, equip you with every good thing. God is not, this is not an optional thing. This is, what he's saying is, this is what's happening right now. God is equipping you for every good thing by his word and his spirit. Uh, that language of equipping, of course, draws us back to the language of um, the body, right? The congregation being a body. Not everyone is equipped with the same gifts, right? Each have unique gifts. Some can walk with children through VBS. You know, others... Don't. <laughs> I don't know. I'm trying to think of gifts. Because you have gifts that I know of that you don't, you're not exercising at the moment, right? Like playing. But you used, to, used to use those gifts. You have other gifts. I don't know. You have, you have fill in blank. I don't really go around. I don't do the whole thing that was popular in the 90s. Remember the spiritual gift inventories? In one sense, it was fine. You'd go and you'd help somebody walk through. Here's maybe what your skills or talents are, and here's how we... You know, they, you could put them to use within the congregation. Although it usually went the other way. Here's how we want to use you <laughs> in the congregation. Mm. And I, don't want to, I don't twist anybody's arm, which <coughs> leadership doesn't like. And like, we need more volunteers. I'm like, we'll get more volunteers if we need them. I'm like, what? Yeah, it's true. Like, you can express it. You know, we have this event coming up. We could use some help. But if people see the need, they'll do it. That's a, that's a response of faith, not a response of uh, twisting arms. Sometimes you still have to put a little screw down, you know. Yeah, not always. But anyway, he equips, um, what does it say? Equip you with everything good that you may do his will. So again, there is a grammatical sense there of may, but why put the may at the beginning? God's going to equip you, but there's always that little bit of a hitch, right? Are you just going to do what God equips you for, or are you going to be resistant, unbelieving? That's where it's may in the second half. Either may? Yeah. We could, New King James, could switch over to that and see what they do. This is the problem with translations, is there's always a translator behind them. And the translator always has some little bit of an agenda. I do too when I translate. It's fine. There's always an agenda. It's just like the news media. There's always a bias. Right? They say we're unbiased news. That's their, they're actually lying to you. <laughs> they're not biased. They have a bias. They're not unbiased. They have a bias. Just be honest about your bias. You know? We're, we're Democrat Party operatives or we're shills for the Republican Party. Just be honest about it. You know? We're the libertarian media. We, and then there's people like me who are like, I don't like any, can we just get rid of the parties entirely? Because I don't agree with any of them. Can we just like be free citizens and you know, find what's in common with the majority of people and do that instead of this party nonsense. Anyway, political parties aren't in the Constitution. Funny story. Um, anyway, where were we? Now, oh, it says May in the New King James. Look at that. Make you complete. There's no May in the second half, though. Huh, that's interesting. Working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Right? And notice this blessing only comes at the very, very end. After he's already established all the work that Christ has accomplished for you and gives, delivers to you in the divine service, only then at the end is say, may God use the way he's equipped you now through the forgiveness of sins, the delivery of his gifts for the benefit of others. It's a natural, uh, what do you want to say? Fruit of the work, working of Christ in your life. But it also, this word accomplishes what it says. And that was the thing I wanted to make sure I emphasized here for you. 
when you have these words of blessing, whether you believe it or not, they're doing what they say. <laughs> All right. Uh, think about what small catechism, right? Um, uh, what do you believe according to these words? I believe that when the called ministers of Christ deal with me according to the divine command, especially when they... Now I lost... That's as far as the catechism went in my head today. This is the office of the keys, right? And they deal with me according to the Lord's divine command, right? Called ministers of Christ dealing with me according to the Lord's divine command. This is just as valid and certain as if Christ, our dear Lord, um, dealt with us himself. So he's actually dealing with you through the word of command spoken by the pastor. Okay, enough on that then. Uh, what's the last part? Oh, and then a little bit of a, a little bit of a fundraiser at the end. You know, you know these are the closing announcements after church. <laughs> I appeal to you, brethren, bear the, with the word of exhortation, for I have written to you in a few in few words. It took us a few months to get through it all, but it's there. Know that our brother Timothy has been set free, meaning he had been in prison, with whom I shall see you if he comes shortly. All right, so this is the kind of stuff that, the, to go back all the way back to authorship, which we talked about at the beginning, um, this is why some would say this is, this is still Paul. This letter is written, you know, even though it doesn't bear a lot of resemblance to the, the letters of Paul, maybe he preached differently than he wrote letters. Um, or it could be somebody that Timothy worked with. And that's why I think some would say Apollos, because Apollos followed with Paul as well. Um, and Apollos apparently was quite eloquent, according to Acts. So, maybe. Who knows? Um, but he'll come to you shortly. Greet all those who rule over you and all the saints. Those from Italy greet you. Grace be with you all. Amen. Now there, whoever's writing is writing from Italy because he's greeting them on behalf of the people he's living with at, the point, at that point in time. So, again, I think the, the, historic, the historic teaching of the church uh, is that this was written by Paul. The modern interpretation, of course, is that it's somebody else because we don't believe anything that the historic church believes. Because how could that be? How could it be? I'm going to see if there's anything else here. No, 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 no. No, I think that's good. And that's the end of the book. So it just kind of ends, you know. <laughs> right? Like, okay, we're done. Sermon's over. Let's go. But it's with that blessing, I suppose, the benediction. Even the instructions are kind of just like an appendage on the end. You know? Really, the sermon could have ended back. It could have just ended the sermon there at verse 29. That would have been good for today. For our God is a consuming fire. The end. <laughs> no, I don't think so. All right. So I don't know what we're going to do next. I have some ideas. Uh, one thing that I thought we might do. I'll get back to the end there. Grace be with you all. Amen. One thing I thought we might do is that there is a, um, there's like a young adult equivalent um, handout to what we're going to use for the Sunday school. So we could actually study the same thing that they study in the Sunday school, but at a higher level. Um, the advantage to that, of course, is it's already pre-made. <laughs> I, I don't have to do too much preparation work for that, apart from studying it, um, what, whatever's provided there. Um, or we had talked about other things, but I can't remember what we talked about. No. I kind of wanted to do some uh, some genre that we haven't actually tackled or maybe you haven't tackled maybe one that's a little scary you know like the wisdom literature maybe because it's hard like to, have you ever tried to read through proverbs it's like machine gun fire and you're like slow down man and it's just one like axiom after another um and they don't always t seem to tie together very well it seems to like change the subject mid paragraph and or mid uh, chapter so that's one idea is there something else i was thinking of don't know so if you have any suggestions feel free to throw them my way i may listen to you i may not but about your leaders all right good we got a few things to talk about there you got to hear a little bit about the destruction of jerusalem that's always fun or not uh, let's close them with a word of prayer 
Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given to us everything that is needed for our faith and life in your Son, Jesus Christ. You have blessed us with forgiveness, life, and salvation, um, delivered to us through the word and sacraments here in the divine service. Uh, we ask that you would work in us uh, within the vocations that you have given us to serve one another um, in fear, uh, loving one another as you and Christ have loved us. Um, and you ask your blessing upon our congregation that your work would prosper among us for the benefit not only of ourselves, but also uh, for all those in our families, community, and world. May you grant this in the name of Jesus. Amen.